Good afternoon. This lecture is going to be about systems of particles and it covers material from several sections of the book. The purpose of this exercise will, will help to review some of the things that we've learned already and it will lead into, um, into our next section which is uh, rigid body work energy. So, so far we've learned two different approaches uh, for analyzing kinetics problems. Newtonian mechanics, which we've addressed particles and rigid bodies. Work energy, where we've only addressed particles. And then a third approach, which we haven't learned yet, which is impulse momentum. And so each of these approaches have their own advantages. And we've talked about this a little bit, and I'll try and, try and remind everyone of, of some of those. So Newtonian mechanics for particles basically focuses on Newton's second law, which is that the sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration. And this, this law, or this approach, gives an instantaneous relationship between forces and acceleration. So for a given set of forces and a given mass, it determines the acceleration at a single instant. Then if we want to understand the accumulated effect of those forces over a distance or over time, we can combine it with kinematic relationships. You know, the relationships between acceleration, velocity, displacement, and time. An alternative for addressing the accumulated effect of a force over a distance is to use work energy. And so, in essence, that is, that's what work is. Work is, is the force um, over, over a distance. Um, so, so the work-energy relationship gives a, a direct relationship between the forces, the displacement, and the velocity, as opposed to combining you know, the kinetics approach, as we do with Newtonian mechanics, with a kinematic approach. The third type of analysis, which we haven't learned yet, impulse momentum, is good for determining the accumulated effect of forces over time. An advantage of work energy as compared to other approaches is that we only have to consider forces that do work. For example, if a force um, doesn't move or is applied at a point that doesn't move, it doesn't do work. Or if a force is applied in a direction that's perpendicular to the direction of motion, then again it doesn't do work. And so we don't have to, to include that in our analysis. Another advantage is that in some cases we don't need to know the whole path of a particle, just the endpoints, in particular for conservative systems or when analyzing uh, conservative forces. You know, to determine the work done by, 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 a, by weight or by a spring, we don't need to know the entire path that the particle or the point of application of the force goes over, just its initial, its initial location and its final location. And so again, this, is, this can be an advantage of the work energy approach. So now we're going to talk about systems of particles. Um, everything that we've learned and we will learn can, can be applied, you know, just as they were applied to particles, they can also be applied to systems of particles. And so when we do this, um, we there are, there are advantages or disadvantages to considering the particles making up the system individually or considering the system as a whole. So you can see down below an example of a, of a system of particles here. You have four particles and they're connected by, by, massless, you know, by massless rods. And so each of those rods transmit a force and and the, the force on each end of the rod is equal and opposite. And that, you know, that goes back to, um, well, it goes back to Newton's third law, which states that, you know, that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. And so one advantage of considering the system as a whole is that it allows us to ignore the internal reaction forces since they cancel. You know, since the every action has an equal and opposite reaction, 
the action force and the reaction force um, have equal magnitude but opposite direction. So when you add them together, they sum to zero. And so this is, is an advantage of, of defining um, your body uh, as, as the entire system. Sometimes, if you want to know what the internal forces are, then, then you would rather uh, analyze the particle individually. And so this is, again, our system of particles. If we analyze a particle individually, you know, particle one or particle two, then you will have the sum of the forces equals the mass of the particle times the acceleration of the particle. And those forces applied to the particle can be external to the system or they can be internal to the system. And so here we represent the external forces by the capital F and the internal forces by the lowercase f. And so, for example, if you look at particle 1, the external force is F sub 1, or capital F sub 1, and the internal forces are little f sub 2, 1, and little f sub 4, 1. If instead, well, if we sum the equations for each of the particles in the system, then you have, you know, a summation of external forces and a summation of internal forces. And since each, each internal force has an equal and opposite, you know, pair, um, an interaction pair, they all cancel, and the sum of the forces, you're only left with the external forces, i.e., um, you know, the capital Fs. And on the right-hand side, you have the sum of the, of the products of the masses times the accelerations of each particle. The right-hand side can also be rewritten as the total mass, m, times the acceleration of the center of mass. And so we won't prove that here, but this is a fact that we used previously when we, when we applied Newton's second law to rigid bodies. Now let's consider this conceptual example. So we have this figure on the right, and it consists of a man clinging to a rope that passes over a pulley. The man's weight is exactly balanced by a weight attached to the other side, and both the man and the block are motionless. If the man starts, starts to climb the rope, does the weight move? Why or why not? So everybody, you can just think about this for a second. Um, if you'd like to, you could pause, pause the, the lecture while you think about it. But the way that we'll go through it is, is to draw sort of the free body diagram like we normally do. And we have the weight of that mass acting on that side. And we have the weight of the man acting on the other side. And we have reaction forces at the pulley. But if we sum the moments about O, you know, the reaction forces don't impart a moment because they, they have a no moment arm. You know, they act at the reference point. But the moment of the weight, of the 150 pound weight, exactly offsets the moment due to the man. They have the same weight, the same force, at the same radius. If the man starts to climb up the rope, that force is internal to the system. So if we take our, you know, our system to include everything, to include the mass and the man, then you know, the force of him pulling on the rope and the subsequent force of the, of the rope pulling back on him, you know, the tension of the rope and, and the force of him pulling on the rope are internal to the system and they're equal and opposite, so they exactly offset. So even though he's climbing, the, the, the system will stay balanced, and so the weight will not move. Now we will consider a more detailed example, again, of a system of particles. In this case, a truck pulling a series of trailers. 
And so the problem states, a 2,000 kilogram pickup truck is pulling a series of two trailers as shown. The first trailer has a mass of 900 kilograms and the second trailer has a mass of 400 kilograms. The traction force being generated at the road tire interface of the front wheel drive truck is 25,000 newtons. Determine the acceleration of the system as well as the forces in each of the two couplings. Rolling resistance at the wheels may be neglected. So looking at the picture, we have a traction force at the front wheels of the truck, which is in essence, you know, the wheels push on the ground and the ground push back, pushes back on the wheels. And so that force F is 25,000 newtons. We are also given the mass of all the particles. The mass of the truck is 2,000 kilograms. The mass of the first trailer is 900 kilograms. And the mass of the second trailer is 400 kilograms. We're asked to find the acceleration of the entire system, you know, assuming there's no flexibility in the couplings, the, the truck and the trailers move together. We're also asked to find the force in the, in the couplings. We'll call the force in the first coupling T1, or you know, the tension. We'll call the force in the second coupling T2. Looking at the picture, there are forces acting in the, in the y direction, that is the masses and the normal forces. Um, we won't draw those because uh, we're basically interested in the, in the x direction. But the only external force being applied to, to this system is the, is, the, is the traction force. And so for the three things that we're attempting to find, we can define our system in different ways. You know, we can define our system to include all three elements, the truck and the two trailers, or we can break the, the system up into pieces and look at parts of it individually. For the first element that we'd like to find, the acceleration, I think it's useful to consider the whole system together as one. If we apply Newton's second law, some of the forces equals mass times acceleration to this entire system, the only force that we have is the traction force. The mass of the system is the sum of the individual masses. It's the mass of the truck plus the mass of the two trailers. And the acceleration of the entire system is, is the same. So the advantage of defining our system in this way is that the tension in each of the couplings cancel out because there's, a, there's an interaction pair where the tension, you know, the force of the coupling on the truck is equal in magnitude but opposite in direction of the force of the coupling on the first trailer and, and so on. Therefore, by defining our system to include all of the elements, we can in essence ignore those internal forces. Therefore, the acceleration is the traction force divided by the total mass. Traction force is 25,000 newtons the total mass is 2,000 plus 900 plus 400, which is 3,300 kilograms. If we divide those, we get that the acceleration of the system is 7.58 meters per second squared, approximately. In order to find the, 
the forces and the couplings, then we need to define our system differently so that we may get access to the internal forces. For example, to consider the coupling force between the truck and the first trailer, we can look at the truck separate from the trailers. But we can look at the two, the two trailers together so that we don't have to consider the, the, the second coupling force because that will be internal to the second part of our system. So we can get access to one of the internal forces, but we can still ignore the other internal force. Just looking at the trailers, we again apply Newton's second law, sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration. In this case, the only force is the coupling force. The masses are the masses of the individual trailers which were given. And we multiply that by the acceleration, which we know because we found that in the first part of the problem. So the two masses of the trailer summed together equals 1,300 kilograms. The acceleration that we found is approximately 7.58 meters per second squared. We multiply those together we get that the coupling force is approximately 9,850 newtons. We can also address the second coupling force in the same manner that we did the first coupling force, except in this case, we'll break our system up so that one part is the truck with the first trailer and the second part is the second trailer so that we expose the tension in the two cup in the second coupling and we don't have to address the coupling in the between the truck and the first trailer because it's now internal to the system and so again we can do some of the forces equals mass times acceleration. And in particular, we only need to address system two. The only force acting on the second trailer is the second coupling force. Its mass is 400 kilograms, and its acceleration is the same acceleration for the entire system that we've been using. We multiply that out we get that the tension in the coupling, in the second coupling, is approximately 3,030 newtons. And so this example illustrates how we may want to define our system differently in order to either A, keep internal forces, um, you know, keep forces internal to our system so that they cancel, or to expose internal forces so that we can solve for them. We will now look at work energy for systems of particles. And so, as shown, the work energy balance is the same expression as we use for individual particles. We can use this also for systems of particles. And just as with Newtonian mechanics, by defining our system to include multiple particles, we can often neglect, uh, we, we often don't have to explicitly consider the internal forces because their work cancels. In particular, if the body is rigid or the particles are connected by ideal frictionless connections. And you can, you can see why this would be true because at, at a joint 
or at a point where, where two particles meet, uh, if there is an interaction pair where the action force and the reaction force are equal and opposite, and they act over the same displacement, then the work done by the action force will be equal and opposite of the work done by the reaction force, and so they will sum to zero. When we're considering the energy of a system, the total energy is just the sum of the energies of the individual particles. For example, the kinetic energy of the system is just the sum of the kinetic energies of the individual particles. So each particle we have here is given a subscript i. So m sub i is the mass of one particle. V sub i is the velocity of one particle. Same thing with gravitational potential energy. The gravitational potential energy of the system is equal to the sum of the gravitational potential energies of the individual particles, where h sub i uh, locates each particle. With the gravitational, with the elastic potential energy, the total potential energy is equal to the sum of the potential energies of the individual springs. So in this case, k sub j is the stiffness or the spring constant for one, one spring, and x sub j is the deformation of one spring. And so the total elastic potential energy of a system is equal to the elastic potential energy of each of the individual springs. In general, we can also use the principle of conservation of energy for analyzing systems of particles, but we must be careful of non-conservative internal forces. For example, if we have a joint uh, that has friction, friction is a non-conservative force, so energy will not be conserved even if it's internal to the system. We can also imagine that maybe we have a joint that absorbs energy for example, some sort of damper um, or joint that deforms. Um, and again, that, that would be non-conservative and it would, it would change the, the energy of our system. So we must be a little bit careful when we, when we, address cons when we apply conservation of energy to systems. We can now write the sum of the kinetic energies of our system of particles in a different way. As we saw in the previous slide, the total kinetic energy of our system is equal to the kinetic energy of the individual particles. We can rewrite the vi squared term as a dot product because since v, the two vi's are in the same direction, the dot product is just equal to the square of the scalar magnitude. We can then rewrite the velocity of each part particle with respect to the velocity of the mass center. So the velocity v sub i is equal to the velocity of the mass center plus the velocity of the ith particle relative to the mass center. We can then expand, expand that product um, using the, the notion of foil. So the product of the two vg vectors, again, since they're in the same direction, they're equal to the square of the scalar magnitude. Same thing with the product of the velocity of particle i relative to the mass center. And the inner terms, since, since the two vectors are not in the same direction, we actually have to perform the dot product. But, but that's the, the expression that we get. We can then expand and distribute the 1 half and the, and the individual masses into the parentheses to get this expression. Looking at the first term, the velocity of the mass center is common to every term in the summation, so we can factor it out of the summation. In the second term, the same thing, the velocity of the, of the mass center is common to every term in the summation, so we can factor it out of the summation. And then in the last term, we just fa factor out the 1 half. With the first term, the sum of the masses of the individual particles equals the mass of the, the total mass of the system, which is m. 
the middle term, this isn't something that we're going to prove, but uh, this, uh, this summation sums to zero. And you can sort of imagine you know, if, that, if we have a rigid body that is translating and rotating, you know, we might have some particle where one component is moving to the, to the right relative to the mass center and one component is moving to the left relative to the mass center. And so when you sum them, they sum up to zero. So that's sort of not very rigorous, but, but hopefully it gives you some intuition. And then the second term stays the same. And so what we have is the first term is in essence, you know, it's the, it's the kinetic energy of translation. Um, that is the one-half mv squared for the, the translation of the mass center. And then the second term, it's the kinetic energy of the motion of each particle relative to the mass center. And that, in essence, is due to the rotation. If the system's not rotating, then, then V I sub G is zero. Um, the, the particles have the same velocity as the mass center. But if our system is rotating, then that term is non-zero, and this, in essence, represents the kinetic energy of the rotation. Continuing with this derivation, we can also ex find an expression for the kinetic energy of, of a rigid body in general. And, and we will, that will become more clear and we'll use it in the, in the next class. But this is the expression from the previous slide where the first term is the kinetic energy due to the translation. The second term is the kinetic energy due to the rotation. We can then rewrite this by considering particle I as rotating about the mass center. We sort of remember this, that the velocity of I relative to G is equal to the angular velocity of the body crossed with the position of particle I relative to G. So if we consider it in that manner, we can rewrite the velocities as, as r times omega. And since the angular velocity of the entire rigid body or the entire system of particles is the same, as long as the system is rigidly is, is rigid, we can factor out the omega squared. And what we're left with is something that may look familiar if you, if you think back. In essence, that is the mass moment of inertia of the system of particles. So this gives the final form of the kinetic energy of a system of particles, where again, this term is the kinetic energy of translation. And the second term is the kinetic energy of rotation. And if you examine those two, you will see that they have a similar form. You know, for translation, it's one half mass times velocity squared, where mass is translational inertia and v is translational velocity. And the second term has a similar form, where it's one half rotational inertia times rotational velocity squared. And so again, this is something that we will use more in the next class. We will now apply the principle of work energy to a system of particles. Reading the problem statement, we have that a ball, mass one of four kilograms, is attached to a light rod which is pinned at point O. The rod is free to rotate in the vertical plane, and it is desired to determine the velocity of the ball when theta is 90 degrees if the system is released from rest at position A. 
and ultimately we, what we want to do is to calculate the velocity for the two cases shown in the figure in the bottom right. In the first case, the other end of the rod has a mass block of mass 10 kilograms attached to the end of the rod. And in the second case, instead of having a block, we have a force that has the same magnitude and direction as the weight of the second block. We are also told the length of the rod and the distance of the sphere from the point O and the block or the applied force from the point O. And so in this case, we will define our system to include everything, the rod, the mass, the block. And by doing so, any interaction forces, for example, between the rod and the ball, do not need to be considered explicitly because any work done by those interaction forces are equal and opposite and hence sum to zero. So looking at the situation, we're given that the mass of the ball, mass 1 is 4 kilograms. We'll go ahead and start with case 1. The mass of the block, m2, is 10 kilograms. We're given the lengths l1 is 300 millimeters, which is 0.3 meters. L2 is 150 millimeters, which is 0.15 meters. We're told that the rod is light, so we'll take that to mean that the mass is, is zero. And we're told that the, the system begins from rest. So in essence, the velocities in position A are zero, or position A is the, the bar is exactly horizontal. And we want to find the velocity of the ball in position B. We'll use 1 to represent the subscript of the ball, M1. So we have that picture there. Um, I will go ahead and and, and address case one first on the next slide. So we have all of the givens and what we're trying to find from the previous slide. If we look at this picture, you know what we want to do as always is draw the free body diagram. So we have the weight of the ball. We have the weight of the block. We have the reaction forces at O. And we have the internal reaction forces between the rod and the ball and the rod and the, and the block. If we look at this situation, energy is conserved in the system because the only external forces that do work are the weight forces, which are conservative. and the reaction forces don't do any work. That's because that they're applied at a point which doesn't move. You know, work is force times displacement. If you have no displacement, the force doesn't do any work. So since energy is conserved, we have the kinetic energy at state A plus the potential energy at state A must equal the kinetic energy at state B and the potential energy at state B. Since we're told that the system starts from rest, the kinetic energy at state A is zero. We will define our datum in, in any number of ways, but I will go ahead and define state A to be our datum. So the, the initial 
position where the bar is horizontal, we will define that to be our datum. Therefore, in state A, both the ball and the block are at the datum, and so their gravitational potential energies are zero. So going further, so the energy of this system is initially zero, and then we want to look at the energy at state B when the bar is completely vertical. So the kinetic energy, the total kinetic energy of the system, if we recall, is the kinetic energy of the individual particles in the system. So we have the kinetic energy of the ball, which is 1 half m1 v1 squared, And then it's the kinetic energy of the block, where that block has a mass m2. We'll say that it has a velocity v2. And then same thing with the gravitational potential energy of the system. It's equal to the gravitational potential energies of the individual particles. And so in state b, the ball is the distance l1 above the datum because that's the length of the rod from O to the ball. So mgh, in this case, the mass is m1, g is the acceleration due to gravity, and the height is l1. And then similarly, the, the block is below the datum, so its gravitational potential energy will be negative. So. It has a mass m2, and its distance below the datum will be l2, because that's the length of the rod. If we look at that expression, um, we know the masses, we know the lengths. So the only thing that we don't know are the velocities. But since we have a rigid system, the velocities are related to the angular velocity of the, of the system. So we can rewrite v1 and v2 as, as r omega. In this case, the radius of the ball is l1. The radius of the block is l2. And we'll just say omega is the angular velocity of the rigid system. gravitational potential energies stay the same. Now if we look at that equation, we have a single unknown, which is omega, and we can solve for that. So we can move the gravitational potential energies to the other side. So the m2 g l2 becomes positive when we add it. The m1 g l1 becomes negative when we subtract it. We can factor out the omega squared, and we're left with, and then we can divide through, or we divide through by 1 half m1 l1 squared plus 1 half m2 l2 squared. And then to get rid of the square on the omega, we take the square root of both sides. And if we sub in our numbers, we get that at omega is approximately 3.17 radians per second. Ultimately, what we wanted to find was the velocity of the ball at, at state b. And so the velocity of the ball is the radius times, times the angular velocity, where the radius is l1. So l1 times omega gives us a velocity approximately 0.95 meters per second. We can then look at case 2, which is very similar, but instead of having a block, 
m2, it's replaced by a force. But that force has the same magnitude and direction as the weight force of the block. It's interesting to note, however, that, that our velocity of the ball at state b will end up being different. So again, we consider you know, the free body diagram. So we have our force F, which is already drawn in. We have the weight of the ball. We have our reaction forces. In this case, energy is not conserved because we have this external force F, which is, which is not conservative, which is not weight, which is not the force due to a spring. So since F is not conservative and it's not canceled or anything by something else, it actually does work. It acts over a distance. We need to calculate the work it does. And we can use the general relationship that the work done by the non-conservative forces equals the change in energy of the system, i.e. the change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy. And so in this case, the change in kinetic energy that we're interested in is the change between state B and state A. Same thing the gravitational potential energy. It's the same situation we had before where the system initially starts at rest means that the kinetic energy at state A is zero. We will again define our datum to be the initial position of the system where the bar is entirely horizontal. So the initial gravitational potential energy of the system is zero. The work done by the non-conservative force, um, F you know, dotted with displacement, the force is constant, uh, you know, constant magnitude, constant direction, we can bring it outside of the, the integral and, and that's why we don't have to solve an integral, we just have F dotted with displacement. In this case, um, the displacement takes sort of a circular path, but we only have to consider the component of the displacement in the direction of the force. So the, on the component of the displacement in the the y direction, in essence, is, um, is L2. Um, the, that end of the rod, the point of application of the force, starts at the horizontal level, and it ends up being straight down a distance L2 below O. And so the work done by that force is F times L2. On the right hand side, the kinetic energy of the system is just the kinetic energy of the ball because there is no block anymore. Same thing with the gravitational potential energy. We just have the gravitational potential energy of the ball since it's a above the datum it's positive, it has a mass of m1 g and then a height of l1. Looking at that equation the only unknown we have is the velocity of the ball at state b. So we can solve for it. On the left hand side we have the work 
is F times L2. We subtract off the gravitational potential energy term. We can divide by the one-half mass. And then to get to, to clear out the squared on the velocity, take the square root of both sides. We plug in the numbers. You know, where F is M2G. If we compare that to the, the expression from case one, um, it's very similar. Um, except, you know, so the numerator is the same, same. But the denominator is different because we don't have any kinetic energy from the block. We only have the kinetic energy of the ball. So if we plug in those numbers, we get that the velocity of the ball at state B is approximately 1.21 meters per second. So we'll go ahead and stop there. Um, we'll continue some of these concepts in the next class when we address kinetic energy for rigid bodies. If you have any questions, I will be on campus for the rest of the week, um, so please stop by and see me.